Welcome to this BLM review of recent developments in product liability law. In a few moments, I will give a 10 minute presentation on recent developments in respect of liability relating to medical devices in the European Union. Specifically, I will be talking about the European Court's recent decision in the Boston Scientific case and also the recent referral to the European Court from the PIP breast implant litigation in Germany. Following this, my colleagues, Emma Tyndall and Megan Hopper, will each spend 10 minutes discussing some emerging risks. Emma will consider the potential risks presented by the use of drones. And finally, Megan will talk to you about 3D printing and the potential liabilities relating to this developing technology. Dealing first with the Boston Scientific decision, I will give you a brief overview of the background to this matter. I will then address the two key findings made by the European Court in respect of one, proving a defect, and two, the damages that can be recovered in respect of such a defect. For each, I will talk about the wider implications of the court's decision. I will then move on to talk briefly about a potentially related referral to the European Court in the PIP breast implant litigation. In the Boston Scientific case, the European Court considered the inter interpretation of various provisions of the EC Directive concerning liability for defective products, otherwise known as the Product Liability Directive. The request arose from an appeal heard in a German court concerning implantable medical devices, namely a pacemaker and a cardioverter defibrillator. In respect of both, there was a risk of premature degradation. The consequences of such degradation could be heart failure or death. As a result, perhaps understandably, the devices were replaced. But crucially, it was not known whether the devices replaced were actually defective. It was only known that there was a risk that they were. Following the operations to replace the devices, the relevant health insurance organisations sought reimbursement for the costs of such operations from Boston Scientific, which was the producer of the products for the purposes of the Product Liability Directive. The court was asked to consider the interpretation of this article. Specifically, can a medical device implanted in the human body be considered to be defective on the basis that products in the same product group or production series have a significantly increased risk of failure? but where a defect has not been actually detected in the medical device in question. The court's finding on this was that where it is found that some products in a group or from the same production series have a potential defect, it is possible to classify all the products in that group or series as defective, without there being any need to show that the product in question is defective. In reaching this decision, the court stressed that for the pacemakers and cardioverter defibrillators in question, the safety which a person is entitled to expect is particularly high. This is because of the particularly vulnerable situation of the patients using such devices and the abnormal potential for damage. The result of this finding is that consumers may be able to prove that a product is defective under the directive and importantly for us under the UK's Consumer Protection Act if that product is from a group or production series where others in that group or series have been found to have a potential defect. The court did not mention whether the failure rate of such a product would be relevant, but I would suggest that it must be. I suspect that the point at which a failure rate will be sufficient to establish a defect in all products in a group may well be the subject of future litigation. It is important to note the court's comments that the pacemakers and cardioverter defibrillators in question were used by particularly vulnerable patients, had an abnormal potential for damage, and that therefore the safety requirements that such patients are entitled to expect are particularly high. It is also worth noting that it is uniquely difficult to extract and test an implantable medical device in order to show that it is defective. Future claimants may argue that the criteria adopted by the court could equally apply to safety critical components of motor vehicles like brakes, where a failure could be fatal. But in such circumstances, defendants may want to argue that it is not so difficult to extract and examine a vehicle component. Indeed, the application of this case is arguably limited to products that fulfil the court's particular criteria. That is, implantable, life-sustaining medical devices used by vulnerable patients where the potential for damage is abnormally high. 
many other non-life-sustaining medical devices would not fulfill this criteria. For example, the potential damage caused by a breast implant with a risk of rupture may not be considered to be sufficiently or abnormally high, and such patients, who in some cases may have voluntarily chosen to have breast implants to improve their image, may not be deemed to be particularly vulnerable. That said, there is scope here for claimants to expand on the findings made by the court. For example, there may be an attempt to apply the court's rationale to breach of contract cases and particularly the test of whether a product is considered of satisfactory quality. Defendants should be prepared to argue that the court's findings in Boston Scientific are unique to the high level of protection afforded by the Product Liability Directive. The court also considered Articles 1 and 9 of the Directive. These articles state that a producer shall be liable for damage caused by a defect in his product and that damage is defined as, among other things, damage caused by death or per by personal injuries. Specifically, the court was asked to consider whether the costs of the operation to replace the medical devices constituted damage caused by death or by personal injuries. The court found that there should be compensation to cover all that is necessary to eliminate the harmful consequences of the defect and to restore the level of safety which a person is entitled to expect. It followed then that if the operations to remove the defective medical devices were necessary to overcome the defect in the product in question, then the cost of the operation would constitute damage caused by death or by personal injuries for which the producer is liable. The court's view of damage in this context is a somewhat liberal interpretation, particularly when compared with the UK court's arguably more conservative approach to both the concept of damage recoverable in tort and the interpretation of damage in product liability insurance policies. For example, under UK law, a ceiling installer would not normally expect to pay for the costs of removing all potentially defective ceilings, whether or not in fact defective. Indeed, defendants should be wary of any attempt to expand on the concept of damages in such contexts. I will now talk briefly about another recent referral to the European Court for which a ruling has awaited. In April, a German court referred an issue from the PIP breast implant litigation to the European Court. The German court sought clarity on a discrete point relating to liability for medical devices placed on the market in the European Union. The request concerned notified bodies which are in charge of granting the CE mark required in respect of all medical devices placed on the EU market. One such notified body, TUV Rhineland, is being sued in Germany for damages relating to the relevant breast implants since the breast implant manufacturer, PIP, is bankrupt. Effectively, the German claimant says that TUV Rhineland should have stopped the breast implants from being placed on the market. The EU court has been asked to consider whether the work of a notified body is supposed to have a protective effect towards patients such that patients are entitled to claim damages directly from the notified body. It is notable that hundreds of patients in France, as well as a handful of distributors from various countries around the world, have so far been successful in suing TUV Rhineland in France. In the French litigation, it was held that TUV Rhineland owed a duty of care to those patients and distributors and breached that duty of care by failing, for example, to carry out unannounced inspections of the PIP manufacturing facilities, or properly scrutinise PIP's production records. The French judgment has been appealed and the appeal judgment is weighted later this year. If you would like to know more about this referral and its potential implications, then please do not hesitate to contact our product liability team. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk. I hope you found it useful. Emma Tindall will now talk to you about the interesting issues related to drones. Welcome to my talk about drones. I'll be considering the potential risks presented by the increasing use of drones and the opportunities and challenges which they present to the insurance market. I will be considering these topics primarily from a product liability perspective. There are three parts to my talk. I will first consider the current uses of drones and the growth areas which have been identified. Secondly, I will consider the current regulatory regime, the issues which the regulations must address and the balance which they are attempting to strike. There are a significant number of proposed regulatory changes and I will briefly touch on these and the potential impact of them. 
Thirdly, I will consider the potential risks associated with drones and the insurance cover which may be needed by parties who are involved with either the design, manufacture or supply of drones or the commercial or private operation of them. Firstly, what are drones and what can they do? The term drones was coined as a catchy alternative to unmanned aerial vehicles and refers to all remotely piloted aircraft systems. Drones have notoriously been used for military purposes in recent years and the name has taken on a less acceptable connotation as a result, but many other future growth areas have been identified. Many dangerous jobs have been earmarked as those which may benefit from drone technology, including search and rescue, public security and firefighting. The television and film industries are interested in drone technology to assist in filming panoramic camera shots. Some companies have shown an interest in using drones to carry out deliveries, with Amazon leading this technological charge. Amazon submitted a patent for drone approval to the US regulatory body in September 2014, and some of the key details of it were, were revealed in May 2015. Their plans for the Amazon Prime Air delivery service envisage a variety of delivery options being available to their customers, from delivery to a fixed home address, through to a bring it to me option, with the customer's location being identified by the whereabouts of their smartphone. At the more futuristic end of the scale, Amazon has revealed that it is in discussions with DHL and Audi to allow for delivery to the boot of a customer's vehicle using a time-limited digital code to unlock and open the vehicle remotely to allow the product which the customer has ordered to be deposited in the boot of their car. A number of insurers have been given permission to begin trialling the use of drones in the USA to assist in the investigation of claims, particularly in locations which would ordinarily be too dangerous or inaccessible. Private and leisure use of drones has become increasingly popular, with the Daily Mail describing drones as this year's must-have gadget in December 2014. As the market expands, lightweight drones are becoming increasingly affordable. How are drones regulated and what changes are planned to accommodate the increased commercial uses? Effective and consistent regulation is required in order for drone use to become safe and commercially viable and also to enable insurers to assess the risks and devise suitable products. Currently, the regulations require drones to be within the line of sight of the operator at all times, which significantly restricts their current deployment. The existing Civil Aviation Authority rules permit the use of drones without licence or pilot qualification if the drone weighs less than 20 kilograms and most significantly is not being used commercially. If the drone weighs more than 20 kilograms or is being used commercially, it is necessary to obtain a licence for use and the individual who is remotely piloting the drone must have relevant qualifications. Drones which fall into the latter category are also subject to a compulsory insurance regime. Regulatory regimes must balance safety considerations with the effective commercial use of drones. It is clear that drones will not have a widespread commercial use until it is possible for them to be used beyond the line of sight of the operator. Regulators must consider the integration of drones into the complex existing regulatory regimes which dictate the current use of airspace. However, many commercial entities argue that the virgin airspace below 500 feet is currently virtually unused and that this should make it easier to legislate for drone use. The European Commission envisages full integration of drones into European airspace by 2028 and has established a roadmap towards consistent regulation across the EU. The third and final part of my talk considers the risks associated with drones and the products that the insurance market might develop to cover these risks. So, what are the risks and who is at risk? Risks associated with drones can be divided into two broad categories. Firstly, manufacturers, distributors and suppliers of drones will require product liability cover in respect of product and technological failures to insure against accidents caused by defects within the drone itself or the failure of supporting safety technology on which the drone relies. The technology which the drone will require will include detect and avoid software to allow autonomous flight paths to be produced and to avoid collisions between multiple drones and between drones and other airborne devices or fixed structures. 
Drones are also likely to rely on GPS technology to allow them to navigate their way to a final destination. Other software that may be required will depend on the purpose of the drone. One rather sophisticated example of the software which is being developed, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, is aimed at allowing Amazon delivery drones to track the customer's smartphone or vehicle. Secondly, owners and operators of drones will require liability insurance to insure against accidents caused by user error. The risks presented by drones are widespread. The obvious risks include the risk that the drone will fall from the sky as a result of either a mechanical failure, collision with another item or user error, causing property damage or personal injury. There is also the risk that the drone, or its supporting software, may be hacked into. This could result in the diversion and theft of the drone itself, or, potentially, the theft of data which the drone has access to. An example would be, if the drone was being used for an Amazon delivery, the risk to the customer's personal Amazon data. If the drone was being used to collect surveillance for claims investigations, the data collected, which could include photographs or video footage of an accident scene, may be at risk. In addition, there is a risk that the drone or the item that it is carrying could be stolen. These theft risks range from simplistic and opportunistic thefts, where the drone is physically seized as it comes to land, through to the sophisticated diversion of the drone by hacking. Privacy concerns have also been raised, particularly in the US. If the drones have camera equipment on board because, for example, they are gathering information to assist in search and rescue investigations, people have raised concerns about drones taking photographs or video footage of their private property. The risk can therefore be divided into the following categories. Personal injury and property damage. Theft or loss of sensitive data. Theft of physical property. And privacy concerns. So, what insurance products could cater for these risks? A multitude of different insurance policies are required to cater for the different parties who are exposed to a wide range of risks in relation to drones. The risk of personal injury and property damage caused by a manufacturing or design defect in either the drone itself or the software which it relies upon will require manufacturers, suppliers, distributors and retailers to hold appropriate product liability insurance. Similar risks caused by user error will require users and operators of drones to carry liability insurance, which is likely to be loosely modelled around existing aviation policies. This is already the subject of compulsory insurance for certain categories of drones, including those weighing above 20 kilograms and those being used for commercial purposes. Insurance cover will also be necessary to allow for the theft concerns which I outlined previously. The physical theft of either the drone or the item which the drone is carrying is a relatively straightforward risk and would be the subject of first-party insurance, similar perhaps to first-party motor policies. The risk presented by the possibility of a party hacking the drone and accessing sensitive data would be covered by a cyber risk policy. The market for specialised cyber insurance policies covering the risk of electronic theft of sensitive data is growing. This cover is available on a first-party basis, covering the risks of business interruption, reputational risks and notification expenses and on a third party basis covering the risk of security and privacy breaches and the payment of compensation to individuals affected. I hope you have found this talk useful and I will now hand over to my colleague Megan Hopper who will speak about 3D printing. I will now talk about 3D printing, also known as additive manufacturing from a product liability perspective. My talk is broken down into three parts. Firstly, I'll provide an overview as to what 3D printing is and give an example of how it has been used to create a gun that is capable of firing real bullets. I will then consider how 3D printing might affect liability before putting this into context using a case study to consider the various parties which may be faced with a claim. Finally, I will end with a brief look at how 3D printing may evolve in the future. So, what is 3D printing? 3D printing is the process of creating a three-dimensional solid object from a digital file on a computer known as a computer-aided design file, which provides the 3D printer with instructions for what to print. An object is created by printing layer upon layer of material, such as plastic, resin, metal or ceramic, until the entire object is complete. 
Each of the printed layers is a thinly sliced horizontal cross section of the final product. Perhaps surprisingly, 3D printing technology has been around for more than 30 years. In the early days, its application was geared towards producing complex, high value, highly engineered parts for use in the aerospace and automotive industries. However, during more recent years, 3D printing has revolutionised the way in which a wide variety of products are made, from architectural structures, including basic, single-storey houses, to prosthetics, custom-built earphones which fit a buyer's ear precisely, jewellery and even edible desserts. In 2013, the industry was valued at 2.5 billion euros, which increased to 3.8 billion in 2014, and Wohler's Associates, a 3D printing industry analyst, expects the industry to be worth 10.8 billion euros by 2021. 3D printers are becoming more affordable, and it is therefore conceivable that in future, 3D printers will lead to the general public being able to affordably create a very wide variety of products at home by downloading a CAD file off the internet and printing an object off. In my opinion, Professor Engstrom of Stanford Law School has encapsulated the key issues in her article entitled 3D Printing and Product Liability, Identifying the Obstacles. She says, 3D printing democratises product creation. Many more individuals will make products that are complex, sophisticated and dangerous. An interesting example of how 3D printing technology can be used to create a dangerous end product is the Liberator gun which was the first 3D printed gun to be manufactured and fired in May 2013. Testing by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives showed that although it was not quite as powerful as most guns, it could penetrate several inches of soft flesh, as well as a human skull, and ultimately they described it as a lethal weapon. The gun, which was made entirely of plastic, except for a nail which served as the firing pin, and could easily be purchased separately, included a small block of steel which made the gun detectable by an airport scanner and rendered it legal in the US. However, the metal did not play a role in the weapon's function and could easily be omitted, therefore making it undetectable. The design files were downloaded off the internet over 100,000 times in two days before the US government intervened and ordered removal of the files, although the design is still available via the Pirate Bay website. What issues arise from a liability perspective? One might question who, other than the person firing the 3D printed gun at someone else, could be liable for injuring or even killing another. But what if a user fired the gun and it exploded in his hand? Could the creator of the CAD file be held liable? Or the 3D printer manufacturer, or even the ink producer? For example, is there an obligation on them to tell users not to produce dangerous or explosive products such as guns? Or might it be argued that the user voluntarily assumed the risk himself? This brings me on to the second part of my talk of how 3D printing might affect liability. As I have mentioned, 3D printing is used to create a wide variety of products. At the high end of the market, for example, GE has its own 3D printing facility where it produces fuel nozzles for its advanced jet engines. Also, within the last few months, Rolls-Royce announced that it will flight test what it claims to be the largest 3D printed aerospace component to ever power an aircraft. At the other end of the scale, there is the use of 3D printing to build low-risk, one-off products, such as board games and decorative figures. It is arguable that at both ends of the scale, the use of 3D printing technology is not a great cause for concern for insurers. At the high end, it is arguably not much different from using other advanced manufacturing techniques, and the process of determining liability for injury caused by a defective product will therefore not be much different. At the low end, it is difficult to see how an innocuous, one-off product like a board game could give rise to injury or damage to property on a scale that would trouble insurers. However, Uncertainty lies with 3D printing usage which falls somewhere in the middle. In other words, when individuals or SMEs use this technology for production runs, leading to a greater circulation of 3D printed products. This raises various questions. For example, 
Will the producer know what is expected of them in relation to ensuring that the safety of the products they create is such that persons are generally entitled to expect under the Consumer Protection Act 1987? And how will they ensure quality control? Will individuals and SMEs have the expertise to understand the safety of design they have purchased or even downloaded for free from a designer in a country halfway across the world over the internet? How will the material which the product is made from perform over time, especially if it is used in an unusual product or as a hinge or weight-bearing part? Will there be a variety of inks available, both official and unofficial, which differ in quality and durability? And will this affect the safety of the product? And will the end user be given sufficient information on what to expect in terms of safety and durability from a 3D printed product? Let's look at a case study. Imagine there is a school fundraising event and two parents decide to download a CAD file from, for a bag clip, which can be used to seal bags of crisps. They print the clips using a 3D printer. The parents then give the clips, which have the school's name or own branding on, to the school to give it to its pupils. Imagine that one of the bag clips breaks and hits a pupil in the eye, causing serious injury, who is potentially liable. Perhaps the most obvious potential defendants are the parents who created the bag clip, since they are the manufacturers or producers. However, although we might expect them to be strictly liable under the Consumer Protection Act, if it is found that the bag clip was defective, the problem for the pupil is that the parents will have a defence under the Act as they did not supply the bag clips for a profit or in the course of business. A claim in contract is clearly not possible, as there is no contract between the pupil and the parents. A claim in negligence is possible, but the parents might be able to demonstrate that they discharged their duty to take reasonable care. This may be satisfied if they used the reputable brand of 3D printer and printing ink, and if they obtained what was ostensibly a safe design, for example, if other people who had used the design published a review online confirming that they had used it without mishap. The second possible defendant is the designer of the digital file that was used to create the clip. However, if the designer shared the CAD file for free, then they are unlikely to be held liable, as they did not supply the design for a profit or in the course of business. Also, in order to succeed, the pupil would have to show that the end product was created exactly in accordance with the original design. Another potential defendant is the manufacturer of the 3D printer. But, but to succeed, the pupil would have to show that the printer itself was defective at the point of supply. Similarly, to successfully pursue the producer of the material that was used to create the bag clip, it would be necessary to show that the material itself was defective. These are likely to be difficult hurdles to climb. The final possible defendant is the school as an own brander of the product, but it too would have a defence under the Consumer Protection Act on the basis that the own branding was not done with a view to profit. A claim under the Sale of Goods Act is also likely to fail, as that would require a contract and consequently consideration, in other words, payment or similar, as well as intention to create legal relations. It is likely that the pupil would have a better chance of succeeding with her claim if the parents had sold the bag clips to the school for a profit, as this would mean she could claim under the CPA, or if the school had sold the bag clips to the pupils, as it would be possible to claim for breach of contract. Viable claims exist in these circumstances, and this arguably causes the greatest concern for insurers. Does the policyholder truly understand the risks relating to the products it is selling? The final part of my talk is a very brief look at the future for 3D printing. Further application of this technology is expected by combining it with highly advanced materials known as 4D printing. The fourth dimension is the functionality of materials. Some materials can change substantially and deliberately over time when exposed to water, temperature changes or air and can also self-assemble into predetermined shapes. It is therefore envisaged that the technology will be used in the medical industry for implantable biomaterials, organ printing and for cancer-fighting nanobots. I hope you've enjoyed listening to my talk and have found it useful. Further information on all of the topics which we have discussed today is available through BLM's Specialist Emerging Risk Group, which is comprised of various lawyers across the firm. 
Literature is available on other emerging risks including nanotechnology, electromagnetic frequencies from mobile phones and food and drink, among other topics. Please do get in touch if you want to know more. Thank you for listening.